Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Declan Mulcairn from Middleton, Wisconsin. I'm a fifth year in the Meadwater School of Music studying horn performance. I have the utmost pleasure to introduce Associate Professor of Horn, Dan Gerboy. Today, Dan will be sharing his personal story about his career as a professional, professional musician and his journey to get there which more resembles a fractal than a path from A to B, but which ultimately landed him at the UW's Meadwitter School of Music. The former chair of contemporary performance at the Mahan School of Music, Dan now serves as director of the electroacoustic research space, EARS, a facility which he founded with funding from a UW 2020 large equipment grant. He's also the Hornets in the Meridian Arts Ensemble, a New York City bass sex set of brass and percussion, now in its 34th season. He was a freelance musician from 1989 to 2011. Dan performed with some of the most classic, uh, some, some of the most highly esteemed classical music ensembles in New York City, including the Metropolitan Opera, Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, New York City Opera, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, and St. Luke's Chamber Orchestra. He appeared on numerous recordings of classical music, rock, and jazz, including how I knew of Dan Frank Zappa and he has performed in the orchestra pit for some 36 Broadway shows, resulting in thousands of performances. Please welcome Dan Gerboy. Thank you so much, Declan. It's great to be talking to everybody about the horn and how I got to my position at the Meadwitter School of Music. And I wanna start by telling you a little bit about this instrument that I'm holding in my hands, the horn or French horn, uh, uh, some people object to calling it a French horn because it's not actually French, uh, but there is a reason why it's called the French horn, which is that the best instruments used to be made by the French. And so if you wanted to go get yourself a horn, you'd get a French horn, you'd get a French horn. And uh, so here we have it, French horn or horn. This instrument is often thought of as being the hardest instrument to play. And I'm gonna tell you why. And I think I'm gonna start with telling you why it's difficult. So here, I'll play a few notes for you. The horn goes quite low. And quite high. And if I play without pushing my valves down, Those are the first three notes I can get, all on the same fingering, namely no valves. The next octave is a lot more notes. And the next octave there's a lot more notes still. And then if I keep going up, they're sort of infinite. And so the notes, those open notes, get closer and closer and closer together. If you can imagine a piano keyboard in which as you go higher, as you go to the right and the notes get higher, the keys get skinnier and skinnier, and it's harder and harder to push down one key without hitting the other keys, then you know what it's like to play the horn, except that we're using our lips and our air instead of our fingers to make the notes. And as you see on any one fingering, you can play a whole lot of notes. I'm doing all of that elephant calling just with pushing one valve down. So um, that's the instrument. I've been playing the horn for 47 years. So it's kind of a nonstop adventure on this instrument. Um, it has such a beautiful sound. It can play soft. Or loud. It has a very rich romantic orchestral sound. So now the question is, all right, Dan, you've been playing this thing for 47 years. What have you done with it? So before I totally get into those details, let's just show you a couple of um, other horns. Um, if we can look at the slideshow here, this is a natural horn. You can see that the horn is really just a tube that's bent uh, up into a circle to make it portable, carryable, playable, not 15 feet long. And if you see around the middle, there's all these 
little extra pieces of tubing, they put the horn into a different key. So if you're playing in the key of E flat, you'd probably be using the crook that's in there right now. And if your piece was in the key of F, you'd play a shorter crook. Um, so this um, was what the horn was like. It's kind of like a bugle until the valve was invented around 1820 or so. And as you can imagine, the valve was invented. It diverted air into a little extra part of the instrument. And these valves did not work very well. Um, they weren't really embraced until around 1880 when and, and even after that, the French were still playing their natural horns. They would have orchestra sections with natural horns and valve horns. Uh, this is a horn from Vienna. It's a, these are only played in the Vienna Philharmonic. It's a different design of instrument. So instead of the valve opening up a little tube in, in the way that my valves, which are called rotors do, this is just a completely different mechanism with a thing that goes in and out and and opens up the tube and it's hard to describe, but it's a kind of a cool looking instrument. Here's me struggling to play the natural horn. I'm not a comfortable natural horn player. And I think that comes through in this picture. Uh, this was in a performance with a student where we played some duets on the natural horn. And here's me trying out the kind of horn that I now play. The horn that you saw me play is a Yamaha and it's a, it's a new design of instrument and so I went to Yamaha's showroom and tried a whole bunch of them and decided this is the instrument I want to play. And I, I love this instrument. And um, Yamaha is famous for making precision equipment. And these instruments are really precision equipment. So we can kill the screen share for now. And I'll talk to you a little bit. So I was born and raised in Williamstown, Massachusetts in the Berkshires. And um, in, in Williamstown is a really small town, but we had a band program. And in fifth grade at age 10, I took up the horn. I had a lot of instruments that I wanted to play and somehow settled on the horn. And I really liked it. I played in band. I moved quickly from the red band to the gold band and fancied myself a real pro at that point. Uh, and I went to high school and I played in band as well. And I also uh, played in a brass quintet outside of my high school and went to a wonderful music camp where I decided this is what I want to do. I'm very comfortable playing this instrument and I love it and I love music, love classical music, which was all I listened to as a kid was classical music, believe it or not. Um, for college, I wanted to go to a school where I could continue to study music, do a lot of playing, um, but also pursue academic interests. And I ended up going to Yale because there was a graduate school of music there. So there was clearly a commitment to music um, but there was also great stuff to study. And I was a music major, but not a performance major because they don't have performance major. So I learned a lot about music theory and about music history. And I played in uh, the Yale Symphony and I also played some in the graduate school orchestra. And I played a lot in the uh, graduate school's chamber music program. And I really caught on fire with playing chamber music. I loved playing music in small groups. Ended up going to a bunch of music festivals uh, that focused on chamber music and uh, realized that that was a thing that I really loved to do. After college, I moved to Paris because I'd spent a year in Paris as a kid and loved it and figured I had to move somewhere. And I lasted about six months until I ran out of money and came back and moved to New York and decided that I would be a freelance musician and that my phone would start ringing with many people offering me work. And sadly, Nobody knew who I was, and that didn't happen at all. So I enrolled in graduate school at the Manhattan School of Music, and I got to know people. And music is the most social business there is, I think. Being with people, working together with people, criticizing each other in a friendly way, working together to produce a, a professional product, and getting along and hanging out, as you'll see from some of my slides, is absolutely crucial to the business of music. Um, so I met people at Manhattan School, School of Music, and I began freelancing in New York. And I did lots and lots of different kinds of work in New York, which is why Declan described this career of mine as more of a fractal than as a unidirectional path from one thing to the next. So this is a picture of me before my beard and hair turned gray. And this is at Alice Tully Hall, which is the recital hall at Lincoln Center. And it was a concertos program where I played a horn concerto, huge thrill, terrifying. 
um, got reviewed in the New York Times positively, thank God. And uh, this is one of the things I did was play in various groups, sometimes uh, infrequently, but sometimes as a soloist, often as a member of a small orchestra or a larger orchestra. Um, this is also at Lincoln Center. This is the Chamber of Music Society of Lincoln Center uh, put together a program, a kids program, um, where we played a piece written for kids. And then we went out into the lobby and we set up an instrument petting zoo. And, um, and each player that had played in the concert had, had an instrument available there that was uh, given by a shop for kids to try. And I just love the look of this young girl as she's trying to play the horn. And you can see the discomfort and it just takes a long time to get used to blowing into a brass instrument. Uh, but you can also kind of tell from her eyes that she's having a good time with it. As Declan mentioned, I played in a lot of Broadway shows. I actually started freelancing on Broadway because I took an audition for the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. And this was so long ago, I didn't win the job. The person, this was so long ago that the person who won that job has already retired from that job. Um, but at that audition, I did quite well and I advanced out of the first round into a very small semifinal round. And there was another guy who was in the, in the semifinal round and he said to me, who are you? I've never met you. And I said, I'm Dan Graboy. And he said, where do you live? And I said, I live right here in New York. And he said, well, why don't I know you? And I said, well, I'm brand new. And he said, well, if you got this far at this audition, you must be good. Would you like to sub in my show? And I was flat broke. So of course I you know, was absolutely thrilled. And I started subbing in his show, which was City of Angels, which is on this list of Broadway shows that I played, which I put together. This is just a screenshot of a page from my CV. Um, so I started subbing at City of Angels and boy, my mind was blown because this was a big band score. It was, it's a modern show, but it was written in the old big band style. And all of the players in the pit were jazz musicians. And I had never played jazz. I had never studied jazz and learning how to fit in to that situation was a challenge for me. And that was, it really sums up the challenge of freelancing. You're put in a situation and expected to do the job. In a Broadway show, when you're going to sub in the show, because the main player only has to be there for half the shows and can get subs for the other half of the shows. And so there's a lot of subs who rotate through these shows. And But the orchestras, once they've, they're have they through with their initial very brief rehearsal period, the orchestras don't rehearse anymore. So the way that you get, you learn how the show goes is you sit in the pit with the regular player while the show is going on. And it's called watching the book. You have a copy of the music that the horn player is playing or whatever your instrument is, and you watch them play. And then the next time you go in, you play it. And so I very, very, very quickly had to fit in with this style. And this kind of thing, having to fit in, happened to me over and over and over again in my career. And I really prided myself on being quick at figuring out what was the style that I needed to match, what that meant, how loud, how soft, am I playing with loud instruments, with soft instruments, am I expected to be very expressive or expected just to fit in and keep a low profile, and these are skills uh, that are gained through the experience of freelancing. So if you look at this list, you'll see that there's a lot of shows that you've probably heard of, maybe some that you've seen, some that you've never heard of. Uh, particularly amazing to me was going into sub at Man of La Mancha, the second different production of Man of La Mancha. So early in my career, I subbed at Man of La Mancha and it came back 15 or 20 years later and I subbed in the new one and I felt like, wow, I've been in New York a long time. Um, I was freelancing from 1989 until I came here in 2011, but more, uh, more about that as we go on. So I did play in, in many, many, many pits and I had two shows of my own. Um, one was The Lion King. I was in uh, The Lion King at the very beginning uh, of the run of that show. And when Broadway reopens, I think that show will still be going. It'll probably be going my whole lifetime. 
Um, and it was not a good time for me to have my own show. I, I had many, many, many other commitments and ended up leaving that show after only six months. And then I decided I didn't want my own show and I turned down a ton of shows. Um, the reason shows, of course, are a good thing to have is you can sub out half the shows and so you can do other things and still maintain your show and provide work to your friends. Um, but uh, about and around 2008, a, a production of South Pacific opened, a Broadway production it was actually uh, at Lincoln Center, but it was a Broadway production. And I was asked to play in that show and I couldn't because I couldn't be there for the very brief rehearsal period. Um, but someone left the show a year and a half in and I stepped in and I ended up playing that show for a year and a half. And I made myself at home in the pit, as you can see, bare feet spread out. Uh, you can see me and a section mate who was making fun of my bare feet, so I took a picture. Um, that pit had a lot of downtime. There was a lot of dialogue without music. So just to give you an idea of the kind of projects one can do, I wrote two etude books in the pit, and I read War and Peace and many other books. So trying to fill the time when I'm not playing with productive work. At that show, we, uh, I started drawing cartoons in the music to illustrate, and I'm not a good artist, to illustrate some of the lines in the show and um, various people who subbed in the show added. And I took a bunch of pictures because I thought that the book was just absolutely charming. I cannot remember, there's a picture of a doctor performing surgery on an alligator or crocodile. Uh, I can't remember what this meant. Uh, I at one point asked everybody what their favorite scotch was and got a very, very nice list of, and I like it, Jason said that his favorite scotch was Sean Connery, very nice answer. Uh, this was a particularly beautifully annotated cartoon. Again, I do not know what the line was that motivated this, but it's certainly a beautiful picture that I had nothing to do with drawing. Uh, at one point, a character says I had to go back to my outfit and unwind. So we have unwind and at the top cut off is the outfit he's going back to and, and where it was stored. And here is Nellie washing that man right out of her hair. So we have before and after pictures. There was a boar's tooth ceremonial and need to take a trip. That is a, a syringe helping one to take a trip. And of course, some enchanted evening, Sam and Janet evening. So in addition to doing Broadway work and doing chamber gigs and orchestral gigs, subbing, having my own work, I, in 1989, I joined a brass quintet called the Meridian Arts Ensemble. And here you see a very early picture. And what happened was, I was uh, in a brass class at Manhattan School of Music in my last semester. The, all the brass students were in that class. And our professor was a renowned tuba player and a tuba instructor. And he got towards the end of that class, uh, I was my turn to play a solo in the class. And very shortly thereafter, the professor got a call from the tuba player in this new group, Meridian Arts Ensemble, and they were looking for a horn player. They had just had their third or fourth horn player quit. And he wondered if, and he had studied with the with this tuba professor. And so he called him and said, hey, do you have anyone at Manhattan School who uh, might be able to play in our group? And, um, and Ray said, I mean, at Toby, the professor said, oh yeah, I just heard someone who would probably be good. And so the group called me and I played with them and I ended up joining that group. And they were playing, they were focusing on contemporary repertoire, very, very, very difficult music, um, very modern sounding. And we entered a competition uh, playing some of this music and we won. Uh, that was called the Concert Artist Guild Competition. And uh, we, because we won that competition, the Concert Artist Guild took us on and managed us for three years. And we also, um, were given the opportunity to, to record a CD. CDs were pretty new at the time. I actually remember asking the producer of the label, are we also gonna release this on LP? And he said, why would we do that? And I was thinking, why would we release a CD? No one has a CD player, which ironically is the case again, many years later. Um, but after, um, 
after we recorded our first CD, we started playing music that wasn't such hardcore contemporary music, but rather was um, music influenced by what we like to listen to. So we were playing some jazz, we were playing some rock and roll. One of the members of the group was got very, very into the music of Frank Zappa and started making arrangements of that music. And we realized that we, um, well, first of all, that the image of us as classical musicians didn't work very well for playing that kind of music. And that's why we took a picture like this, where it was a little more uh, hip and modern, at least in our own minds. Um, and we also um, took on a drummer because the kind of music we were playing really needed drums. Um, we didn't need guitar and bass. We were fulfilling those roles on brass instruments. Um, and so um, that was the beginning of the Meridian Arts Ensemble and that group is still going. And I'll give you a little visual history. You can see a quick visual history of us aging as we move on. And uh, you can see the gentleman close to the right-hand side with, um, with marimba mallets uh, was our drummer. And we're back to working without drums now, keeping it much simpler. Um, here's another picture. So some of our pictures were more modern, some were more traditional looking. And this is coming closer to the present day and you can see the gray intruding into the beards. And um, there were many, many aspects of the career of this group and continue to be. Here we are playing um, music by young composers while they watch. And this is something that we have done at almost every university that we've visited, and that's many universities, is um, asking composition students to write us either pieces or do little arrangements or snippets of pieces. And then we play those pieces for the composers. We tell them if they've written something uncharacteristic for our instrument that makes it extremely difficult to play. Uh, one thing that we'll often have to say to young composers is you've written this very high and we could never play this in a program because it's so tiring. Your piece is two minutes long and it has the exhaustion factor of a piece that's 30 minutes long. Don't forget that we use our, well, we use, sorry about that. I just got a call coming through. Um, we use our lips to play the instruments and our, the lip muscles are not particularly strong. And, um, and so fatigue is a real issue. Um, so here you see us rehearsing, I'm talking about something. And the fun thing about chamber music is that nobody is telling the group how to play. We have to learn how to speak to each other in a way that's both critical uh, and respectful. And it is, this is a skill that we pass on to our students. This is not a skill that was taught when I was in school. Um, and I am not exactly sure why, and I wish it had been, because it turns out that it is extremely difficult uh, to make suggestions to artists of the highest order who are very happy with how they're playing. And so learning how to communicate in this way is a huge part of a chamber music career. Uh, I'm so pleased that I did learn how to do that. I hope my colleagues. Uh, in the various groups that I play in, agree that I've learned how to do that. Hanging out is very, very, very important, especially with a group that travels a lot. And this group has played in 49 of 50 states. Unfortunately, the one left out is Hawaii, so we'll have to try to do something about that. Um, we've been abroad all over the world, and uh, there's always a need to go out together after the concert and to be social with each other and to get along and have a beer and have a good time and immerse ourselves in the culture of wherever we go. And this is one of the tremendous, tremendous joys of playing music. It's funny because in America, in Europe, when you say I'm a musician, people say, oh, that's so wonderful. And in America, when you say I'm a musician, people say, well, how do you make a living? Um, and it's true. The music business can be hard to make a living in, but the perks of being in the music business are so incredible. We get to travel, we get to be our own boss. We control our own finances, even if they're at the low end of the scale. Um, in, in Meridian, we choose the music we wanna play and we choose how to play it. Um, if a member retires or resigns, we get to choose who comes in afterwards. There's no administrative structure. Um, 
and we get to play the music that we love and we get to do what we love all the time. Um, and we get to show what we do to our audience and try to reach them on some level. Um, sometimes the musical music is difficult to listen, especially on a first time. And then we make it our job to try to make that accessible, not only through introducing it before we play it, but through playing it in a way that it really reaches people as a, a statement of emotion, because music is a, is a sound statement of emotion. Working with young students is a huge part of Meridian's career. Of course, it's a huge part of my teaching career as well. This is some Dutch students in Holland where we spent a great deal of time. Of course, eating. And since I was on the subject of Holland, I put in this picture of herring. Uh, it's cured herring. If you ever do make it to Holland, you absolutely must eat this. And here's a picture of a performance. Uh, it's interesting performing in a touring group because you're in a different hall every single time you play and you need to figure out not only how to do this very difficult concert tonight when maybe you feel different from how you felt last night, but also in a space that sounds completely different. Uh, so always on your toes, figuring out each new space. And then of course there's equipment malfunctions. That's a mute of mine that something fell in and my tuba colleague uh, put a little chewing gum on the end of a stick and fished out the piece that fell into the mute. This was a trip to, uh, to Cuba, so the smoking of a cigar was absolutely required. We were so fortunate to be able to get in and perform and work with students in Cuba. And shortly after we did that, um, it was in the George W. Bush era. And shortly after we did that, the border closed and arts groups were not able to go. So we got that trip in just under the wire. This was a trip to Finland. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is you can see that the gentleman on the back end is playing French horn, um, but the, the man and the woman in the front are playing instruments that nobody in the United States plays. They're called alto horns. And, uh, and I, hadn't, I had never seen one at the time that I coached these. These are amateur musicians. And it was so cool to me that there are traditions in other parts of the world where different brass instruments are still played that have just vanished from the United States. This is in Oaxaca. Um, our group was very fortunate to go to Mexico and in particular to Oaxaca many times and get to know the people there, eat incredible food and uh, just um, really get to know Mexico, learn to speak a little bit of Spanish. This next picture shows a banda. It's a brass band um, up in the mountains outside of Oaxaca in the state of Oaxaca. And this is the, the Diaz family band. And uh, we made friends with Faustino Diaz, who is an absolutely incredible trombone player. He grew up and learned how to play brass instruments in this band. He plays the trombone at a top professional level, likewise the trumpet, likewise the tuba. You're not supposed to be able to do that, but he can do that because his dad, who ran the band would say, well, now you're going to learn the tuba. So he would learn the tuba. And the, every single person that you see and all the other people who you can't see in this picture, all part of the Diaz family, all with the last name of Diaz. And in Meridian, our trombone player recently retired after many, many, many years of service. And Faustino Diaz is now the trombone player in the Meridian Arts Ensemble. So we were able to take that personal connection and really grow it into an incredible relationship in our ensemble. And this is a, this is a class of horn players who I got to teach in, in uh, Mexico. And you can see if you look at the instruments here that they all have a slightly different shape. The trumpet is an instrument where the shape has been pretty much regularized, like, like the violin. You, you don't see different designs of violin. You don't see a whole lot of different designs of trumpet, um, but these horns all look a little bit different in the details. It's fun to see that in the shop. And this is a concert at the gorgeous concert hall in Mexico. This, I'm just gonna take you through a little bit of a travelogue. Uh, this is Romania. This is, we, we decided to work with a composer and commission a mini opera, a one act opera where the instrumental 
music would be played by our group with a, our percussionist playing a lot of different instruments and with two singers. And this was the premiere that was a concert version. We actually also ended up doing a staged version of this opera. Huge thrill to get to be part of the creation of an opera. And this is a picture that was taken two weeks ago in Cleveland at a recording session. So you can see all the microphones. We're just getting ready to start recording. Um, so we are still going today, more gray hair, um, but still having a fantastic time playing in that group. Um, playing in that group has led to many, many opportunities for us for recording 12 CDs, playing for Frank Zappa, uh, recording on um, a recent album by Natalie Merchant, going all over the world, but it also has given us job opportunities. And most of us in Meridian ended up securing full-time tenure track and ending up as tenured teaching positions at major universities. And in 2010, I applied for a job at the University of Wisconsin-Madison it was um, a little bit scary because the, uh, the retiring horn professor had been here for many, 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 many years. He actually, when I was at a music camp in high school, I studied with a student of Doug Hills. So I knew I'd known my whole horn playing life about the University of Wisconsin-Madison and about my predecessor, Doug Hill. And now, uh, now here was his job opened up and I applied kind of with my heart in my hands and got the job. And part of this job, amazingly enough, is playing in the faculty brass quintet. So here is a very early picture of that first group of uh, the Wisconsin brass quintet. And I say first group because a brass quintet has two trumpets and we have only one trumpet professor. Um, and that's John Ailey on the right-hand side of the picture. And I'll tell you about his trumpet in a second because it is unusual looking. Um, and then our second trumpet player is always a graduate student. And so every two or three years, uh, we have a new second trumpet player. So this is the first iteration of the Wisconsin Brass Quintet. And uh, the interrelations between the brass faculty here and with my career are just incredible. Mark Hetzler is the trombone professor. You can see him in the bottom left of the picture. And he studied with a trombonist who was who coached me in chamber music. And John Stevens, our tuba professor in the lower right, studied with Toby Hanks, who I mentioned as the professor of the brass class that I was played in, which got me my job with Meridian. And um, all of the people in the Wisconsin Brass Quintet have a relationship with the New York Brass Quintet. Um, and so we all come from the same tradition. And music is a business of traditions, um, sometimes following in a tradition, sometimes rebelling against a tradition, but we all come through the same background, which has made it incredible to work with my fellow faculty members. Um, part of being on the tenure track is continuing with research activities. And for us, research activities means performing, giving master classes, um, recording pieces, sometimes composing pieces, arranging pieces. So I was fortunate enough to have a trip to China uh, to go to a horn workshop. And here I am being puzzled about who that guy is in the picture in China. Um, uh, part of being uh, on a faculty is just keeping up with the business. In my case, it's the French horn business and that means going to horn workshops. And here I am with my student, Dan, having just bought that horn that you're looking right up the bell of. And he is, as it looks like, writing a check for that instrument. And to get to go with a student, help the student pick out an instrument that's, that works for that student is a real, <clears throat> real pleasure, as you can see in the next picture. This is a picture of Brandy with her new horn. Same horn workshop. Um, recording is something that musicians do and that I've done quite a bit of. And my big, ten, big tenure project, the project that I did as an assistant professor was writing a, uh, the music for a CD. I was, had gotten into electronic music, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. But if we could come away from uh, this picture, I'm holding up the CD that I ended up producing right here. And it's called Air Names. And it is 
I call it a CD of music for electronic horn. I recorded all of the um, horn parts processing my instrument through electronics. And then I hired a drummer and a bass player, a local bass player and the drummer from Meridian Arts Ensemble to come and record uh, the drum and bass parts for the CD. So if we can come back to the screen share to look at this picture, uh, this is the drums in, in the recording studio and you can see some overhead mics. And you, if you look closely under the closest symbol in the middle, you can see another mic picking up some other drums and on the floor in the very bottom right of the picture, the bass drum tends to be very boomy for recording. So it's enshrouded in something that dampens it. That's part of that recording session. And um, this is the producer of, of the, that session. And you can see that he's at a traditional mixing board. But if you look on the computer screen, that's a picture of the mixing board. And uh, the recording process has really moved almost entirely onto computer screens now. So actually, he would control the computer screen and the, the dials and faders on the mixing board would pop up and down depending on what Mike did on the computer. I did get very interested in electronic music. I had um, seen my students at Manhattan School of Music when I taught there in contemporary music, um, getting really fired up about electronic music. And my colleague, Mark Hetzler, who you saw in the Wisconsin Brass Quintet picture was also into electronic music. So here you see the two of us uh, playing with a visiting pianist. And I have in the bell of my horn, a, a mute, that has an electronic pickup in it. So you actually can't hear the acoustic sound of the horn. You can only hear the processed sound. And I also, uh, Mark and I co-founded a ensemble called $2 Broom for students in which they would use electronics and they would improvise. Here's a $2 Broom, a one $2 Broom group in Music Hall. And here's another group. And the beauty of this is that any instrument can play. Uh, you don't have to play any particular instrument. The music is all improvised. I um, ended up getting a very large, very generous grant from WARF, a UW 2020 grant to establish an electronic music studio. And this is a picture of EARS as it came to be called, the Electroacoustic Research Space. Uh, it had been renovated, carpeted, painted. Here's my son a number of years ago and me uh, very proudly looking into the new empty space. And I am sitting in that space right now. I'm going to show you around in just a minute. And here's the director of the School of Music, Susan Cook. And you can see that the, the uh, room is starting to get populated with some instruments and a computer. And in fact, right now, I am sitting in that very chair at that very desk. Here's Mark setting up a pedal board. So I do my electronic music through the computer. Mark does his through pedals like a guitar player would use. And we bought, um, we just bought and bought and bought pedals uh, to create an incredible pedal board. And then figuring out the sequence of pedals was something I left up to Mark. And here's the grand opening of ears. Lots of student and community interest in what happens here. And we'll be back to having open houses in ears as soon as it becomes safe. Uh, probably you like me, look back with a certain amount of wistfulness at being able to pack a crowd like that unmasked into a room. Let's hope that that comes back soon. This, this is a synthesizer and you can see that electronic music is such a, a, a game of saying, what would happen if I turned this dial? What would happen if I plug this, patch this thing into this thing? It makes it um, really an exploration, which is what I love about new music. There's always new things to learn and experiment with. This is my student, Jenna. She was a horn student who just graduated, still is a horn student now in graduate school. And she learned how to play this instrument, the eigenharp. And she is so far the only person to have learned how to play this very complicated instrument. Um, but this is it when I think we had just recently unpacked it and she had said, I wanna learn how to play that thing. This was a project that I was really excited about. I was teaching uh, a group of students to, um, about electronic music and was and um, we ended up collaborating with a cancer researcher from here from UW and he was working with um, cancer survivors and we had this project to write music for cancer survivors 
that would in some way give them a more positive outlook on life and help them through uh, their recovery. So here we have some cancer survivors along with the group and that, that was an extremely rewarding project. And this is a recording that I made a bunch of years ago still with the bare feet and that this recording has now finally been edited and submitted to the uh, label that's gonna put it out. So research activities are ongoing in the music faculty and um, it's always so much fun to work with colleagues. These are not UW colleagues, but summer festival colleagues who I've worked with quite a bit. I got to have a sabbatical in Paris a couple of years ago. And so I'm leaving you with this beautiful image uh, because we lived near Le Dôme, which is a historic cafe. And boy, did we eat. This is a millefeuille, which literally means a thousand sheets. And this one may have had a thousand sheets of pastry in it, a Napoleon basically, so delicious. So getting to have a sabbatical and learn more on a sabbatical, another really, really fulfilling side of a life in music. Um, I'm just gonna play you a couple of little clips of music, just so you can hear some of these things. So here's a little bit of a clip from the CD for electronic horn. And here's just another of another piece on that CD. And if we could leave the screen share for just a minute, um, on that CD, I used this instrument right here uh, quite a bit. And it's an in instrument that I kind of invented. It's um, an Indian oboe-like instrument called a Shanai. And I put a French horn mouthpiece on it and then processed it through electronics. <laughs> And I love this instrument because you can slide around. So I actually uh, played this instrument at a concert and asked the audience if they could think of a name for the instrument and come up afterwards and tell me what they came up with. And a colleague of mine said, well, I'm just thinking there's no reed because it's a reed instrument, but there's no reed. But you do, you do buzz. So I'm as far as no read buzz. So I said, okay, it's going to be called the Noriba. I also, um, in the, I'm about done, but before I finish my show and tell, I wanted to show you a precursor of the French horn. And this obviously is a horn. This is an animal's horn that would go like this on the animal. And this is a shofar. Uh, this instrument is... Um, played at Rosh Hashanah and at Yom Kippur. It sounds like this. And that is the sound that in the Bible blew down the walls of Jericho. I'm currently in the humanities building and I am a little bit nervous that I may have 
blown down the walls here, um, but we seem to be still standing. And before I wrap things up, I want to take you on a little tour of ears as it is now. And I have very carefully not cleaned up because I want you to see this as a working space. So if we look here where I was sitting, this is our computer workstation and it is surrounded by keyboards. So here's the synthesizer that you saw earlier. And here is another keyboard that controls sounds in the, that are made in the computer. And this instrument right here, a continuum fingerboard is another kind of a keyboard instrument. And then over here, we have uh, the device that turns sound into zeros and ones so that the computer can process it. And then above that, looking like a flat basketball is a drum controller. So drum sounds are, exist in the computer and are controlled by tapping. This is an instrument which uh, was in storage in the School of Music. It's a organ that plays quarter tones, notes that are smaller in between them than from C to C sharp. Uh, and Motorola made about 17 of these. It's a collector's item. And you can see there are some screws here and it's out from the wall. Uh, just before um, I started this talk, I had an electrical engineer over to try to help me figure out how to make this thing work. This is called a vocoder. This is an instrument that if you know Peter Frampton's music from the 70s, you've heard the vocoder a lot. And this is a theremin. Um, if you think of the theme music to the old Star Trek, you know what the theremin sounds like. And then we have a guitar and a bass. And over here, we have another side of the room, which usually is where that pedal board is set up, but it's dismantled now because we were using it for other purposes. Lots of speakers in the room. I can fit an ensemble of four or five or even six people in here. That's ears. I just wanna conclude uh, by saying that I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have landed in, first of all, to have found the French horn, an instrument for which I felt like I had an affinity and continue to feel that way. And just gone from one opportunity to the next and ended up in a university environment like this, where I am encouraged to be as creative as I would like to be. So thank you very much. And I think now we will open things up to questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Dan, wow, what a story. And uh, you mentioned it as a, a fractal and that really <laughs> was right on the head because <laughs> you have lived such an amazing uh, life, my friend. And uh, obviously your talent has uh, led the path for you, but my main question is, when are you starting the travel blog? It really looks like yeah. you've really visited uh, everywhere around the world and experienced so many things because of your music and your talent. Uh, so we'll be hoping for that uh, Meridian travel blog or... <laughs> it's funny because in, I started keeping a diary in Paris on, on the sabbatical in, in the fall of 2019 and, and said, why, why not turn this into a book? And I'll call it on sabbatical and I'll write about all my experiences living in Paris as a sabbatical place where I'm doing research on electronic music. So I wrote what I think might be about 75 pages. And then we came home and I was thinking about it and then the pandemic hit. So it, this book may end up having either disappearing or being some sort of amalgam of pre and post pandemic. We'll have to see. Well, I would be a purchaser, just so you know, mm -hmm. I have to do it. I'll give you a free copy. <laughs> so a uh, couple of questions for you. Um, can you talk just a little bit about, I know that you've done some work on campus through the Soundwaves program and your work obviously integrating with STEM departments, right? And so can you talk a little bit about that STEAM to STEM uh, integration and your work in that? Absolutely. So I, of course I got very excited in, in 2010 when I was hired to come here. I guess it was 2011 when I was hired to come work at the university. Uh, I grew up in a college town in an academic family and uh, am, as I mentioned, I got a bachelor of arts degree, not a music degree. And 
and I love learning about science. I'm, I like listening to Science Friday, and I'm just that kind of nerd. And so I thought, well, I'm going to university. I would like to find people who are like me, who like science, and they like concerts also. And I went to John Stevens, who you saw in a picture. He was our now retired tuba professor. And I, he was the director of the School of Music. And I said, hey, I had this idea to, um, to have a concert together with science talks. And he said, great idea. You should go to the Arts Institute. So I went to the Arts Institute, which is now, by the way, the Division of the Arts. But I went to the Arts Institute and I um, talked to Norma Curlin, who was the uh, director of the Arts Institute. And I said, hey, I have this idea, science talks and music. And she said, great idea. You should go to Discovery. And I said, what's that? And so she told me what Discovery was and directed me to it. And I found Laura Heisler, who runs the programs in the Discovery Building, which is, for those of you who don't know, the Interdisciplinary Science Research Building on campus. And it's a fabulous building, which everyone should see the inside of when you possibly can. And I said to Laura, hey, I have this idea. Well, first I went well, I was thinking, okay, I went and saw the building and I thought, oh, this is a big deal. I better have more to present than science and music. So I came up with a thematic approach and I said, I, I had this idea that we could combine talks with performances and we could have a central theme. And I pitched three different themes and I, I thought that she was, and one of them was just music. So uh, scientists could talk about how we listen to music, like how our ears actually take it in, how music travels through the air, have a physicist talk about that, um, have a, a neuroscientist talk about what does the brain do once it gets the signal, and um, have a, a voice expert talk about communicating, and then I could play a piece. Um, so I presented that along with two other ideas, and Laura said, okay, so why don't we start with the music one and then we'll do the other? And I thought, Okay, I guess we're rolling. So we just started doing this and it has, this is our 11th year doing it because I started in my very first year. And we've worked with about 45 UW departments and a few people outside of UW. We've had one Nobel prize winner. We've expanded so it's not just, it's not just STEM and it's not just STEAM, we also, use uh, um, talks from the humanities. So that would be Steham, I guess. We're now a Steham series. Um, and we're able to fuse all these things together. Some seasons I've had a single topic with variations. So I did four presentations, up, down, left, and right were my four themes. Other times it's been a little bit more random and, um, and we are uh, doing one as part of the Science Festival on October 24th at four o'clock. And the theme of that one is New York City. So um, it's been really exciting. We've presented all kinds of music from, um, from a group of students surrounding the audience and playing a piece in the round to a Wisconsin Native American drumming circle to everything in between, if you can imagine what would be in between those two things. So that's wow, been very, a great satisfaction doing yeah, those collaborations. Very, very eclectic. And I have to say that is an impressive skill set of yours, not only being a, a classically trained musician, but obviously you have immense experience in many genre of music, which is, I mean, fantastic. Um, so tell me, or tell us, uh, your viewers here, your favorite uh, genre of music to perform? Oh boy, I couldn't. Uh, let me give you a list instead. <laughs> I love playing in an orchestra, but I also love playing in a chamber group. I love playing romantic music, but I love playing really gnarly contemporary music. I've played a lot of rock and roll. I love that. Um, I've played some jazz. That's fun, even though I'm bad at it. Um, but you always have room to grow. Um, it's really hard to think of a kind of music that I don't enjoy playing. And as I mentioned early in this talk, the hang, being with the other musicians is so great also. And being able to be with a different group of musicians, 
or having the Wisconsin Brass Quintet as a stable group and the Meridian Arts Ensemble as a stable group and then doing other things with other musicians is just amazing to me. I, I can't believe I get to do that. Tell us uh, your biggest musical inspiration. Who, who would that who? be? I have a few. Um, there's horn players who most of the viewers of this have never heard of, like Barry Tuckwell and Radovan Vladkovic. Um, in the rock world, I'm a huge fan of Frank Zappa's, of course, because I've played so much of his music and played for him, played his music for him. Um, I love the band King Crimson. I'm a huge fan of Adrian Ballou. If anybody uh, doesn't know the group King Crimson, you should check them out for sure. Um, but there's, there's great musicians everywhere. You know, Renee Fleming's singing is just to die for. And and Oyston Bodsvik's tuba playing. You know, who would have thought? But yeah, he's an incredible tuba. The tuba player here on the faculty, Tom Curry, totally inspiring. Um, you know, my colleagues, I, I could just, we don't have time for me to list all the inspiring musicians. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, one one final question. Uh, and maybe don't give it too much thought because it could be a deep question, but just sort of off the cuff. You flash forward a hundred years from now, what do you see French horn players, the life of a French horn player in a hundred years? What do you think it'll look like? Right, let me just start right now. Right now we've got the pandemic and it's been very, very stressful for orchestras. Orchestras don't make money and they have large payrolls, they're expensive. And this may be the real rise of the small group. Uh, we'll see. I think it's so much easier for a small group to travel, especially during the pandemic, um, um, to coordinate um, the, the personnel in a small group is much easier to deal with than the large, you know, 80 plus people in an orchestra. So, also, this is a time where there's a lot of crossing over of styles. So you see composers writing brass quintets that are influenced by Indian music or writing string quartets influenced by Iranian music or working rock and roll or jazz into their classical music pieces. So I'm seeing a real blending of styles and, um, and a, a, a spirit of creativity um, emerging a hundred years, who knows, we'll all plug in our wire into our head and, <laughs> and receive information off the network and, you know, and then get in our jet pack and fly off to somewhere and play. It's I was really going to say, uh, maybe your buzz horn will take off. What's that guy called? <laughs> yeah. The, this Noriba will be, a, maybe everyone will be playing these because they're so easy to carry around. <laughs> Well, Dan, thanks so much uh, for sharing your story with us. And I was reading a story about longevity recently and noted that music and friendships and camaraderie um, are part of the longevity story. And it, I think you're going to live to well over 100 based <laughs> on your experiences. So thanks thank so much you. for being with us today. I'd like to thank you. And I'd like to thank the people who tuned in and who will tune in later to watch this production. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dan. Everybody, please tune in next Tuesday. We're gonna be wrapping up our fantastic Meadwitter School of Music series. Uh, next Tuesday at noon, we're gonna be talking to Susan Cook, the director of the School of Music, and she's gonna be taking us on a virtual tour of the beautiful new Hamill Music Center. So please tune in. And uh, Dan, you also alluded to the Science Festival. So the month of October, we're gonna be featuring the Wisconsin Science Festival here on Badger Talks Live. So feel free to tune into our website, badgertalks.wis.edu, where you can see that upcoming schedule of talks. Uh, sign up for our email list. Please consider a donation to support our future programs. Also check out our new uh, podcast. Uh, we did have a couple of School of Music interviews on the podcast as well with Ben Rush. Uh, it's a 15 minute or so commitment. So check that out. A uh, really fun, casual conversation there. On our website, you can also search the roster of over 400 UW faculty and staff that have generously donated their time to speak to organizations and businesses around the state virtually and in person. You can submit a request on our website. We'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thanks for tuning in.